Good evening, everyone in the viewing audience. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Joseph Jordan. I am acting director here at the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, and also currently serving as vice provost for academic and community engagement. And I have the, the very, very happy task of welcoming you to the annual Sonia Haynes Stone Memorial Lecture. This particular program is actually kind of the signature program for the Stone Center during the year. It's one of the oldest programs we have. It goes back to the earliest beginnings of the center and has over the years been a place where individuals from across the spectrum, whether it's in politics, history, uh, in the arts, uh, the social sciences, uh, activism have come to present uh, to our community and to our friends. And we're very, very happy that you've chosen to join us tonight. We have a very, very special guest with us, um, an individual who's been very important in the life of the Stone Center. And I'm happy to say that um, we will be able to hear some of the latest work from her and also get an opportunity to engage with her in questions and answers uh, and a question and answer session at the end of her lecture. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, a very, very special and important gift that the Stone Center has received. Uh, we have been quite fortunate over the years that uh, if you come to the Stone Center building, You'll, you'll be able to see a number of different kinds of artwork, um, cultural pieces and individual uh, execution of work about African-American art and history. Um, includes work by uh, Tim Okamura, by Tony Scott and many others. And just recently, we have been the recipients of a very, very beautiful uh, quilt and this comes from the Francini family. Um, Laura Francini and uh, her family, including her husband, Andrea, uh, and here it is, her daughters who are on both sides. Um, you can see uh, Margot, who was actually a current UNC student and Scarla, pardon me, Scarlett and Liza. And to the left on your screen, you can see uh, Laura, who actually came to us, who was a UNC alum from 1997. So we're looking forward to installing uh, this particular quilt. As you, you can see, uh, the artist is Nancy Havel. And it was machine quilted by Susan and Mark DeSeris. So we're looking forward to installing that in the Stone Center. And we want to thank the Francini family. And we also uh, want you to know how thankful we are and how appreciative uh, we are that you thought of us when you originally purchased this piece. Thank you so much, Laura, Andrea, uh, as well as Margot, Scarlett, and Liza. Okay. We're going to move forward with the program now. Um, we're gonna actually uh, be graced with some opening remarks from Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz, who was not able to be with us tonight, but was gracious enough to record uh, a welcome uh, for the university. And immediately after the chancellor uh, completes his welcome, we're asking Jalen Neville to come on and do the introduction of the speaker, uh, pardon me, the life and legacy of Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone. Jalen Neville is uh, the Sonia Haynes Stone Sean Douglas Fellow for 2022 and 2023. We're very happy to have her uh, on board. She has been um, diligently working here in the office to help to keep the Stone Center moving forward and to make certain that we stay on task and stay on path. So she'll be joining us to do the legacy right after Chancellor Guskowitz uh, finishes his welcome. So if we can, let us run to that uh, welcome.
bear with us. We'll be right with you. We're just pulling that up. <laughs> On behalf of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, I'm pleased to welcome you to the 28th annual Sonia Haynes Stone Memorial Lecture. From the moment the Stone Center was created back in 1988 at the urging of concerned students, faculty, and community members, it is focused on the interdisciplinary examination of African American and African diaspora lives, cultures, and histories. The Stone Center has made a name for itself both regionally and nationally as a place for cultural, and historical exploration, research, outreach, and service. It continues to encourage audiences to question what it means to be of African descent in the Americas and examine the role that the arts, culture, and identity play in social change and community development. Stone Center programs like this memorial lecture encourage a critical approach to intellectual inquiry, and principled explorations of new and emerging visions of public universities and their role in our lives. That is a central part of who we are here at Carolina. I'm grateful for the Stone Center's contributions in this effort and in other projects that help to build a vibrant and engaged campus community. It's a privilege to be a part of a legacy that has seen every chancellor over the past 33 years play a role in welcoming each Stone Memorial Lecturer. I'm honored to welcome you to this great university at a moment when we are poised to hear from another exceptional voice. Tonight, we welcome Jenna Ray McNeil, Professor Emerita of History at UNC Chapel Hill and a scholar of African American and US constitutional history. Before retiring from her position as a professor in the history department at the end of the last academic year, Professor McNeil was a highly respected voice on our campus. As a scholar deeply invested in the issues of equity, social justice, and the scholarship on African lives and histories, she always reminded us that we can model excellence in those areas if we remain true to the ideals of the university. Our community is grateful to Professor McNeil for her exceptional scholarship and for the extraordinary time and effort she devoted to supporting the Stone Center and the university. I'm honored to have worked with Professor McNeil and I hope you enjoy her lecture this evening. Thank you. Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone was born in Chicago, Illinois on December 13, 1938. She attended Sarah Lawrence College, graduating with a bachelor's degree in social science. It was here that Dr. Stone was first able to explore her desire for empathy and equality as she began crafting a life devoted to human rights. In 1967, she graduated from what is now known as Clark Atlanta University with a master's degree in social work. Knowing there was still more to learn, Dr. Stone completed her master's degree in social ethical philosophy at the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1971. In 1975, she received her PhD in history and philosophy at Northwestern University. Dr. Stone came to Carolina as an assistant professor in 1974, and she immediately began working with minority students on campus to assess what their needs were. Dr. Stone was a close advisor to the Black student movement from 1974 to 1980, and she was a director of curriculum in the African American Studies until 1979. Dr. Stone's greatest gift was her ability to connect with students and make them feel heard. She empowered Black students to believe that their competency and academic ability is what earned them a spot on this campus. When Dr. Stone was first denied tenure by the UNC Chapel Hill Board of Trustees, over 200 students marched in support of Stone from the South Building to Moorhead Planetarium. And following her untimely passing in August 1991, students used that same passion to demand the university build a freestanding Black cultural center bearing Dr. Stone's name. Their organizing efforts, while immensely challenging, ultimately proved victorious. 
we must never forget the hard work, sacrifice, and compassion that characterized Dr. Stone. She imparted a sense of personal responsibility into each of her students, students who would soon contribute to the collective responsibility of supporting and nurturing students of color. Dr. Stone, Dr. Stone inspired a new consciousness among the student body. She exemplified why black culture and history are, un, are indivisible from the American experience. Today, may we continue to uplift the life and legacy of Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone and remember why this building bears her name. Thank you. Thank you, Jayla. We're still having um, a few attendees join, so we're going to continue the program as uh, the attendees come in. But I do want to move forward and introduce the speaker and lecturer for this evening. Um, this is a very, very special uh, treat for me because not only is uh, the lecturer a professor emeritus of history here at UNC Chapel Hill, she is a friend. I will not say old friend, but she is a friend uh, that goes back to my years as a grad student at Howard University uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, as I mentioned, and as the Chancellor has mentioned, uh, Dr. McNeil is a scholar of African American and US constitutional history, and she is widely known for her American Bar Association prize winning groundwork, Charles Hamilton Houston, and the struggle for civil rights. This is recognized as a definitive biography of Houston, um, who actually was Thurgood Marshall's forerunner. He was a law school dean and mentor for many. I believe Professor McNeil has followed in those footsteps as she has educated and served as a mentor for generations of students uh, across the country, not just here at UNC at Chapel Hill. As a historian of record, she submitted with the Howard Law faculty to the Supreme Court of the United States two amicus curiae briefs in the landmark case of the Regents of the University of California versus Alan Bakke. She is also the lead author of Witness, Two Centuries of African-American Faith and Practice at the Abyssinian Baptist Church of Harlem, New York, 1808-2008, with co-authors Houston B. Robeson, Quentin Dixie, and Kevin McGruder. She is as well the co-editor of three volumes with John Hope Franklin, African-Americans and the Living Constitution, and with Howard University Professor Emeritus Michael Winston, historical judgments reconsidered. Professor McNeil is currently completing a book length study. In fact, I would mention a long awaited book length, book length study of North Carolina versus Joan Little and the free Joan Little movement. And many of you remember uh, how that galvanized many people in this country around the case of Joan Little and the, the move and the push to free her. Professor McNeil was born in Texas and is one of, it is one of four children of Jesse Jai McNeil Sr., a doctor of education, who was formerly a pastor, author, and professor, and of Pearl Lee Walker McNeil, PhD, formerly a community activist, ecumenist, professor, and author. As you can see, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and we're so happy that she chose to fall in our backyard. And without further ado, let me introduce you to Professor Jenna Ray McNeil, my friend and colleague. I also want to let folks know that we're going to have a very brief Q&A at the end. So if you will, you can register your questions in the chat and we will make sure that we feed them directly to Professor McNeil. Thank you, Professor. Please join us. And thank you once again for agreeing to do this. Thank you. I count it a great privilege before I begin the substance of this Sonia Haynes Stone Memorial Lecture of the evening to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors, many millions gone, whose sacrifices and struggles made possible my presence today. To them, as well as preeminently my creator, I pay homage first. My spirit compels me now as well to request that in a minute we share in a moment of silence, not only for the ancestors who have gone before, but also for persons departed, 
persons young and older who came with great expectations to become part of UNC Chapel Hill, some of whom are no longer with us on this earthly plane and others whose suffering required that they leave this campus. I wish personally to invite each of you who are attending virtually to join me also in acknowledging through the, the forthcoming silence or either by saying their names, those who are staff, faculty and administration as well as students and alumni whose lives have been forever adversely affected and upended by the crises of the confluence of the trauma of the senseless murders of black people and others of color, the immigration horrors, the January 6th insurrection and the pandemic. In this time of our lives, I believe we be are best served by the profound African philosophical principle, Mbutu. I am because we are. Now, please join me in a moment of silence. I am honored and humbled beyond adequate expression to have been given this opportunity for Sonia Haynes Stone. And I came to this university at the same time. She was my colleague and my friend. While I'm grateful to Vice Provost Jordan for that most generous introduction, I would be remiss if I did not first begin my remarks acknowledging the direction of the extraordinary Joseph Jordan, now Vice Provost for the Ac Academic and Community Engagement, and Sharif Drame, Senior Program Manager, a Stone Center treasure and man of high competence, many creative gifts and great skills. Work, they worked closely with me to make possible a virtual site for this lecture. And Sharif Drame coordinated the development of the PowerPoint presentation, which you will be seeing. And we are assisted this evening by Nija King. Should there be names of others who are involved in creating this program, including those who made the building available to us, who cleaned it to make certain that all would be safe, please know that I'm appreciative of those efforts. I want to lift up one of my heroines of the civil rights movement, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer of Mississippi. It is a story by Fannie Lou Hamer from which I gained the title of my talk. I'll share the first part of the story with you and come back to the ending later. One day, two young people went to see an old man who was the wisest man in the town, planning to play a trick on him. In one of the youngsters' hands was a bird they had caught. They decided they would go to the old man together, place the bird in their hands, and ask the old man whether the bird was dead or alive. And whatever he gave, whatever answer he gave, they would make certain his answer was wrong. It is quite a distance from the old man's home. So while these youngsters are traveling, let me offer you some lessons from history and critical race theory. And because of each person's contribution to my lecture, I am dedicating this lecture to my family, especially my parents whose disciplined work to earn their doctorates kept me inspired. Doctors Jesse J and Pearl Walker McNeil. My siblings in particular, my big brother who assisted me and my ever patient listeners, nephews Stefan, Corin, Kyle, and Jesse J. the third McNeil, and my niece, Carla Jean McNeil Jackson, Esquire. Also, I dedicate this lecture to my students, former students, and colleagues, all those struggling for justice, and my African American historian mentors, including John Hope Franklin, Edgar A. Toppin, Vincent G. Harding. Mary Frances Berry and Bernice Johnson Regan. 
I wholeheartedly believe, as my mentor Vincent Harding so eloquently explained, that when we search deeply into the struggles for truth, justice, and hope of any human community, we will emerge from the exploration with lessons that were meant for us all. Because the work of the historian requires discipline and rigorous in-depth research, assessment of sources and critical analysis of sources that can be identified as evidence to facilitate the production of excellent and accurate scholarship. It has the capacity to show what actions have been taken and particularly with the use of firsthand primary sources and documentary evidence as well as oral history and artifacts even provide explanations for actions taken and defects in the society at large. While many historians have undertaken such tasks because of the desire to search for knowledge and truth, and I count myself in that number, it is also so important as I speak at this moment from the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History to know that if you peruse African American intellectual history, there can be found in the early post reconstruction era, as one scholar, John Ernest, has described it, unashamedly engaged scholars in liberation historiography. And there still are African-American scholars and writers so engaged among whom I also count myself. I stand on the shoulders of historians who wrote and some who are still writing based upon firsthand sources from African-Americans themselves and from others historical scholarship that highlighted the contributions of African-Americans to this nation's history, corrected and countered false claims offered liberating historical scholarship. I cannot go into all of the names. I encourage you to study the book of Darlene Clark Hine entitled The State of Afro-American History, Past, Present, and Future for a more expansive account, but to name a few of several generations now deceased. George Washington Williams, W.B. Du Bois, John Hope Franklin, Rayford Logan, Benjamin Quarles, Edgar Toppin, Ellen Ed Helen Edmonds, Elsie Lewis, Murs Tate, Earl Thorpe, John Blassingame, Benson Harding, Manny Marable, and James Melvin Washington are among the historians and in intellectuals focusing on our history. There are too many names to call for those who are still writing and I have provided for the Stone Center, which you will see at the end of the lecture, a list of African-American scholars who are too infrequently cited, but whose work has become important for us. With full disclosure, I was mentored by professors John Hope Franklin and Mary Frances Berry with appreciation for the duty of excellence as a foundation for writing the most meticulously researched United States African American constitutional history and seeing it as the privilege of exploring and opening to others truths about the complexities and the beauty, the joy as well as the pain, the substance and the spirit of my people while providing a full context through discussion of the society in which all Americans lived. Recognizing this nation is in crisis I take my place with scholars, many of whom I have named, who believe it their obligation to write for a wide audience in the hope that research revealed can make plain that which has been distorted or not revealed. I'm under no illusion that seeing and facing the truths about the lives and struggles of oppressed people and the ills of this American society will bring forth the changes necessary to rid the nation of systemic racism and economic exploitation and set it on a straight path to a society that guarantees freedom and justice to all because as a human being, each is entitled to that. But what I know for certain is that James Baldwin was right when he declared, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. I have chosen to talk about three lessons from critical race theory, as well as history, which I have for decades taught not only because of the simple fact, not critical race theory inc incorporates as its basic insights and truths derived from race conscious critical study of history and the rule of law in the United States, but also because critical race theory scholars have provided a language and insights that facilitate learning for 
whites as well as people of color in that it does not begin with statements of personal guilt, but rather provides a lens through which people are able to see the big picture of the injustice of a system that so many have incorrectly believed actually operates generally by some even-handed rule of law. What are the key insights analysis of US society reveals? First, racism is part and parcel of the functioning of the United States the normal way in which the system works. Two, a culture constructs its own, it constructs its own history and that culture constructs the rules and practices that are actually constructed to the benefit and the self-interest of the dominant few and not only make rare access to wealth, power and prestige generally but also in the case of African-Americans, other people of color access is blocked. Finally, critical race theory embraces what I will in a moment ask you to do. Focus on the particularity of lived experiences and the societal context in which people live. Critical race theorists insist that any who would seek truth must accept the call to value and take into account context. Time will not permit other details now on critical race theory, but please note that its esteemed progenitor was the great African-American legal scholar, Derek Bell, who is most famous for the thesis that is most abhorred by those who still believe in American exceptionalism in regard to its claim that it is on a trajectory toward egalitarianism and a just democracy. That thesis for which there is copious historical evidence in United States history from Lincoln's use of the Emancipation Proclamation for because of military necessity, the removal of federal protection from the newly freed in exchange for Republican party to have the presidency and the Brown versus Board of Education when the world questioned the United States hypocrisy after World War II. That thesis is the following. It is called the interest convergence thesis. White elites will tolerate or encourage racial advancement for blacks only when these also promote white self-interest. We will leave that up and share some names of critical race scholars while I make two special acknowledgements. The reason that most of you know whatever you know about black history is attributable directly to the efforts of Edgar Toppin, the campaign to expand to a full month of Negro History Week from Negro History Week is the result of his efforts with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History to push for African American History Month. He also initiated a series of documentary African-American history television programs in 1969, the first person ever to do that. I acknowledge also Bernice Johnson Reagan, a founding member of the Singers of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and an extraordinarily gifted and brilliant singer, composer, professor, and scholar who opened ears and hearts to the music of the civil rights struggle helping people of every race and ethnicity place art before them and become attuned to a different way of understanding the African-American experience through songs of faith and struggle. And that leads me directly to lesson number one. I will begin with that. And in a few minutes, you will see the lesson on your screen. To study the civil rights movement in its depths is to discover that African Americans have utilized aspirational language of documents that were never intended for us, such words as liberty and all men are created equal. In addition to Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, so many persons of African descent believe that neither class nor race or race creating a caste system for persons based on color should disqualify a human being from entitlement to freedom. Post-slavery and in the era of civil rights movement, freedom 
as a human right and equal justice were such deeply held beliefs and ultimate considerations that as Vincent Harding has so powerfully written and many scholars have supported with copious evidence. It is myopic to see the civil rights movement arguably the most significant social movement in US modern history as only, and I quote, a black led contest for legal rights. When one delves into the evidence or reads the scholarship of historians who have done extensive research, any reader or student will see it differently and as more than that. As Harding argues, it should be more accurately understood as a black led multiracial quest for democracy in America, for the healing of the nation, for the freeing of all of our spirits. And that story belongs to all of us. Oral histories, documentary evidence, taped, filmed documents from Eyes on the Prize, stories of persons of different races committed to the civil rights movement. When one actually seeks to uncover motivations, beliefs, purposes expressed by persons in the civil rights movement, one sees that it is no minor thing to inquire into what an individual takes to be an ultimate consideration or cease to be so ultimately serious, it rises above all else as that for which it is worth fighting and even dying. It is when you have committed yourself to this kind of inquiry, when recognizing represents a respect for the lived experiences of those persons whom you study, it is then when you are beginning a serious search for not only knowledge, but also truth. An approach of critical consciousness on anyone's student's part entails a desire and willingness to put forth the mental labor to analyze, identify constituent parts of ideas and or events or people's actions and thoughts, and ascertain with as much attention to layers of complexity as necessary, that which is knowledge and meaning below the surface. Thus, I emphasize uncovering and understanding truth require approaching the study of history with critical consciousness and authentic awareness of your own standpoint. The approach of critical consciousness of which I speak is that which I believe in this context of limited time is best defined by the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire. And I quote Freire, knowledge demands a constant searching it implies invention and reinvention it claims from each person a critical reflection on the very act of knowing knowledge is built up in relations between human beings and the world and cannot perfect itself except in critical problemization of these relations if we are genuinely and honestly seeking truth we can find truths in the study of history and that is one of the chief values of the study of history for any society it does not come, however, without a disciplined approach and physical, mental, even psychological labor. It was C. Wright Mills who as a sociologist reminded all interested in truly understanding societies and group behavior, neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both. In seeking historical truths for some study of history is akin to a spectator sport. Since it is past, there is little to be done except observe what scholars say has happened or read an account to obtain some grasp of a chronology. What I want to suggest to you as I speak to the first lesson that I have learned from history and critical race theory is that one does not reach historical truth without physical, mental actions of digging or without fully committing to mental acts of critique and analysis of both sources and yourself. When I speak of approaching the study of history seriously with a critical consciousness and self-awareness, I am suggesting that what I have learned is that you do not discover truths about the past without a willingness to commit yourself to disciplined and deep study of documentary firsthand accounts, what we call primary sources. Oral histories, interviews, every possible source of intentional or unintentional evidence whether it be legislation, a court decision, a newspaper, planned interviews, published in a magazine, a best-selling novel or personal letters, a diary, a song, an artist sketchbook. 
In 2021, one will need to be attentive to social media, texts, emails, blogs, at least if one hopes to write the history of this era. Judgments about reasons for actions, intentions, the meaning of an experience of an individual or group must be viewed within a context and in close attention to how positions in society have an impact on experiences and choices. It is also the case that interpreted history by scholars must be scrutinized for fidelity to authentic, credible primary sources and bias within the use of evidence. Not taking the time to evaluate sources impairs your ability to discern what is or is not true. My mother was trained as an anthropologist and I am recommending that more of us have the courage and the fortitude metaphorically to go on an archeological dig for the purposes that archeologists do excavation. In ways similar to what our own professor Anna Agby Dades has undertaken a dig at the Pauli Murray homestead in Durham. I believe that each of us can effectively and rewardingly undertake a search for truth in history if as we live our own lives and consider the past of persons and organizations, we delve deeply for the purposes archeologists do excavation, namely to interpret the past by locating and analyzing not only artifacts of past cultures, but also what the anthropological society calls features, a, present, a representation of human activity that cannot be removed from the site. In other words, the context. When we go below the surface, we research primary firsthand evidence and seek to comprehend its meaning beyond mere textual analysis. We look at constituent elements within a context to determine the complexity of meaning that can easily elude one who skims the surface. If you study African-American history, you will see that the deeply held beliefs in freedom, a core value as VP Franklin has identified in his book, Black Self-Determination, and he has identified four core values, self-determination, resistance, education, and freedom. And that freedom becomes critically important as we think about or continue to think about the civil rights movement as I talk about lesson one. Young Crusaders, another book by VP Franklin, his most recent, speaks of the centrality of freedom. For example, when in 1965, a policeman who with other deputies had been using cattle prods on women and men marching for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, he came upon an eight-year-old Cheyenne Webb in the crowd and asked her why she was at the Selma courthouse when no adults told her to come. Her answer was this, to be free. Cheyenne and her nine-year-old friend, Rachel Webb, kept attending rallies and sometimes skipping school. They and other children carried signs declaring, let our parents vote. VP Franklin, with the assistance of student scholars who did copious research, chronicles the activism of children and preteens across the nation, not only protesting disfranchisement of their parents and teachers, but also protesting racial segregation and the mistreatment of militant African-American teachers. He provides a series of local examples of elementary school students unwilling in Boston and New York and other Northern cities to tolerate overcrowding or poor facilities and textbooks without any attention to African-American achievement. These students boycotted and their teachers and activists organized freedom schools so that they might learn about the African-American experience and the plight of oppressed people. In the study of African-American history, the vital truths that ought be seen can be overlooked because textbook and internet narratives so easily obscure and rarely direct attention to the complexity that consists of both classic human aspects of the story of Black people in history and their particularities. Mary Frances Berry and John Blassingame remind us that there is power emanating from weakness and patience and hope in the face of overwhelming odds and the unity of masses and elites at various times within African-American history. 
If we dig deeply, we also see through the work of Bernice Johnson Reagan that there are specific understandings of culture and that this little light of mine engages the spirit and the faith of masses of persons preparing to engage in nonviolent direct action despite their clear knowledge that they would be attacked. Bernice Johnson Reagan herself in and out of jails were doing more than just singing spirituals of the ancestors while awaiting bond. For so many in situations of terror and incarceration, the singing conditions as lacking freedom and power. Bernice Johnson Reagan, the scholar best articulated what is vital and can be discovered when one digs deeply with consciousness into the search for truth about African American culture. Sound is a way to extend the territory you can affect. Communal singing is a way of announcing you are here and possessing the territory. When police or the sheriff would enter mass meetings and start taking pictures and names, and we knew our jobs were on the line and maybe more, inevitably somebody would begin a song. Soon everyone was singing and we had taken back the air in that space. In the process of seeking to uncover truth and understand as Marilyn Marable has challenged all of us, it is necessary to ground scholarship in, and I quote, the truths of a people's collective experience from which historical knowledge can be constructed and accurately understood. This then also brings you to fa face to face with the demand of some formerly enslaved African Americans and their descendants from the end of the Civil War, who we learn in the book of Mary Frances Berry entitled, My Face is Black is True, organized under the leadership of a former washerwoman who had been previously enslaved, Callie House, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, created a self-help network called the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association. We learn also the Kambahi Collective in the 1970s promulgated analyses and moved in the Black Power era insisting upon freedom for African-Americans, liberation for women oppressed, not paid fair wages, and humane respect treatment of all who have been shamed, ridiculed, and harmed because of sexual orientation. Courageous women who decided that neither potential danger nor fear would prevent them from being active fully in their own truth. These are but some of the truths to be discovered if one delves deeply into the past of women of African-American descent. As an historian of African-American history, mindful of the role of faith and the role of women in our history, it would be irresponsible of me to speak of digging deeply and approaching study of history with critical consciousness without making a point about modern research. It is quite impossible to be conscientious about seeking truth and history of African-Americans without making earnest efforts to follow the postmodern trends and the research that has been done on women and spirituality among African Americans. Yes, our foreparents' faith is foundational, and we understand the singing and the fortitude of the civil rights movement also in relationship to that. Yet the pioneering work of Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham in her book, Righteous Discontent, and of scholar Cheryl Townsend Jilts in if it wasn't for the women, Black women's experience and womanist culture in church and community, provide critical and insightful foundations for understanding the roles of African women in church, the Black community, and society in our more recent history. What must now not be overlooked is the transformation of Alice Walker's short narrative on womanish to a theology and practice of womanism. Writing in search of our mother's gardens, Walker offers this aspect of womanism, and I quote, loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit, 
loves love and food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, loves herself regardless. As formulated by doctors Dolores Williams and Katie Geneva Cannon, there has been a space made in what has previously been a relatively patriarchal male domain. Here, Dolores Williams. Womanist theology is a prophetic voice concerned about the well being of the entire African American community, male and female, adults and children. Womanist theology attempts to help Black women see, affirm, and have confidence in the importance of their experience and faith for determining the character of the Christian religion in the African American community. Womanist theology challenges all oppressive forces, impeding Black women's struggle for survival and for the development of a positive, productive quality of life, conducive to women's and the family's freedom and well being. Womanist theology opposes all oppression based on race, sex, class, sexual preference, physical ability, and caste. Boldly and even audaciously, to use an Alice Walker term, young women continue to enlarge this new space for understanding African American theology. And parenthetically, I must add that you will hear young Black male preachers who emphasize liberation theology and stress as praxis a ministry of social justice, such as Frederick Douglass Haynes III, Howard John Wesley, and Raphael Warnack refer to and bring into their pulpits womanist preachers. Womanist theology in part within the African-American spiritual tradition as previously conceived has moved those who desire to understand the lived experience of African-Americans and our history in a different way. Even given the critique of scholar Patricia Hill Collins of womanism, there's no doubt that the concrete and theoretical aspects of womanism have permeated African American religion and the manner in which it has become a different and transformative sustaining force. Two examples before I close this lesson on the way we need to uncover and understand truths in history to reach the truth. Examples of how critical approach and deep research must accompany our efforts to analyze and fully know the truth of the expanse of the ongoing African-American freedom struggle come from my own attention to womanism. Although much of the variety and multitude of ministries at Abyssinian Baptist Church of Harlem were covered in the Bicentennial History Witness, one example not present speaks to a practical womanist theology. A womanist ordained minister on the staff at the time completing a PhD at Union Theological Seminary, Ebony Marshall, now Professor Marshall Terman at Yale, was assigned to work with youth ministries and handle a number of other tasks. Her background included dance and her own dancing affiliated with Alvin Ailey. Womanism includes using the entire body and full spirit to express self and faith. And if, according to Alice Walker, you are righteously unapologetically womanish, you are loving dance and the spirit. Ebony Marshall taught in collaboration with Nasha Thomas, an excerpt from Alvin Ailey's iconic revelations choreographed by Ailey himself. The original featured dancer, the inimitable Judith Jameson, who had become the artistic director, came to Abyssinian to hear Reverend Marshall preach one Sunday and see the young people perform to the African-American spiritual, I've been buked and I've been scorned. I do not have time to unpack the full meaning of that, but I hope you can see and feel what I am saying. When the history of African-American women and art and religion is the focus of special study, this is an event and experience that should not be ignored for it yields important truths. On a more theoretical note and with a challenge to future students, scholars and researchers, I must make us all aware that you will no longer be able to research with fullness and present a holistic understanding of American spirituality if you do not attend to social media and digital sources. Even before the pandemic, there emerged a new kind of digital church created by Melva Sampson. And all persons who consider themselves spiritual in whatever dimension were welcome to her pink robe chronicles. 
where as a womanist preacher and professor, she lifted up music and radical theology for the building up of the whole person. How did I learn about this and other uses of digital sources for spiritual formation? By going to a journal that is solely online. The Association for the Study of African-American Life and History's journal, FIRE. In volume six, number one of FIRE, the entire issue is devoted to theorizing the digital black church. In addition to Professor Melva Sampson's article on black digital religious networks, you will discover the ingenious and insightful article by Carla Jackson entitled Hashtags and Hallelujahs, the role of black girl magic that explores performance and social media in spiritual formation. As I close this section of my lecture, I am compelled again to say that it is the deep research and critical conscious approach to seeking truth and history that will bear the greatest truth. Now, there's one thing that I have not addressed that you see in my lesson number one, and that is a comment about authentic awareness of one's own standpoint. Each of you has a standpoint that is defined by how you are positioned in the society and in the United States. What tragically is true is that physical appearance and color as a marker of race determines whether you can ignore or give serious consideration to what you learn from serious study of primary sources and interpreted history. We can avoid considering what is happening in our society and whether or not it may be connected with history if we choose. We can avoid doing the reading or work that is difficult, or we can challenge ourselves to make the effort. There is, however, an even more important decision to make. It is not the choice between avoiding and facing what has happened or is happening, doing or not doing that which is difficult. The more important decision is whether we will live our lives entirely on the surface or we will live our lives digging deeply enough to explore the full meaning of who we are and potentially could be and what our history is. Lesson number two. Silence and silencing further support subordination of the oppressed, stunt growth and sustain structural inequalities of the system. What we learn both from historians and critical race theorists is that our stories matter much more than we think as individuals. Every one of us has stories. Critical race theorists have reminded us when offering their basis insights that members of each society construct their rules, practices, and assignments of prestige and power with words, stories, and silence. Let me share with you a story from a legal case that reached the United States Supreme Court in the 90s. The case is RAV, initials for then a uh, juvenile, Robert A. Victoria, versus St. Paul. When Russ and Laura Jones and their five children moved to a neighborhood in St. Paul in which no African-Americans had previously lived, in the pre-dawn hours of June 9, 21st, 1990, the petitioner and several other teenagers assembled a crudely made cross by taping together broken chair legs and burned it within the fence. They lodged a complaint as African-Americans to the government. The juveniles were convicted under the St. Paul Bias Motivated Crime Ordinance, which says whoever places on public or private property a symbol, object, appellation, characterization or graffiti, including but not limited to a burning cross or swastika, which one knows or has reasonable grounds to know arouses anger, alarm or resentment in others on the basis of race, color, creed, religion or gender, commits disorderly conduct and shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. The trial court dismissed this charge on the ground that the ordinance was substantially overbroad and impermissibly content-based. But the state Supreme Court reversed. It rejected the claim that the ordinance was overbroad because the phrase arouses anger, alarm, or resentment in others from the state Supreme Court's point of view was consistent with a 1942 decision of the Supreme Court that said that words which could reasonably be construed as fighting words did not merit First Amendment free speech protection. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court by RAV, and the Supreme Court's ruling was 
that the state court should be overturned. What was perhaps most interesting about the court declaring the hate statute of St. Paul unconstitutional was the thinking of the justices as exhibited in the opinion. The hate speech statute was declared a violation of the freedom of speech rights of Victor and his accomplices, not because it was overbroad, but because this statute, the Supreme Court rules, was punishing Americans for the content, in other words, subject matter of their speech. Far be it for the Supreme Court to try to regulate Americans' ideas. There are categorical exceptions to the First Amendment, but as noted, when the Supreme Court overruled the state Supreme Court, it did not believe that fighting words, which were to lack any social value, were included in what was represented by the burning cross. Now, if you are shaking your head in disbelief because just about you and anyone else who has studied US or African-American history knows that a burning cross in the history of this nation has specifically symbolized hate for African-Americans, particularly was used by the Ku Klux Klan and on no occasion in American, African-American experience has it meant less than targeting African-Americans for direct harm, you would not be alone. Even Clarence Thomas had a dissent in this case. Nor would you be by yourself if it seemed to you being able to constitutionally place burning crosses on the lawns of African Americans could be construed as an immediate breach of peace. But you see, you would have to be taking into account the lived experiences of African Americans over the history of the United States, and you would have to believe that the threatening of Blacks mattered in regard to the desires of people who defined peace in the white neighborhood. This case provides a clear example of Mary Frances Berry's argument backed with copious evidence in the book entitled Pig Farmer's Daughter. Stories provide a frame of reference that determines what each of us believes is true about the law. They also shape the law and how it is enforced. Antonin Scalia has his own story and knows stories that have been repeated as the stories that count. Insofar as Justice Antonin Scalia was concerned, writing for the court's majority, he found that the St. Paul ordinance was unconstitutional on its face. The conviction of cross burners under this ordinance violated the First Amendment because the ordinance prohibited cross burning that conveyed a message of virulent racial supremacy, but it did not prohibit cross burning that conveyed some other message. There is no doubt that as Mary Frances Berry has shown in other cases discussed in her book, in the case of RAV versus St. Paul, and I quote Mary Frances Berry, whose story counts in legal decisions rests in who controls political and economic power in a process that is circular and progressive. Charles Lawrence, renowned critical race theory scholar and professor, has offered, and I commend to you, an analysis of RAV versus St. Paul that speaks to the African American consciousness and taking race consciousness into account. He says first that in his essay, Listening to the Lessons of Our History, that assaultive racist speech undermines the constitutional value of equality. When racist speech is employed with the purpose of eff and effect of maintaining established systems of caste and subordination, it violates the core constitutional value of equal citizenship. Racist speech, unchecked, permits the dominant majority in a society that is systemically racist to prevent its victims from exercising rights guaranteed by the Constitution, rights to which as citizens, those targeted, are equally entitled. Second, and I quote Charles Lawrence, assaultive racist speech undermines the constitutional value of free speech. First Amendment scholars have identified two underlying values that are implicated in the protection of free speech. The first is the intrinsic value. The second is an instrumental value. Intrinsic value has to do with the manifestation of our humanity and our individuality. The second is the instru 
in terms of instrumental value of speech has to do with the way in which we are able to participate fully in the public discourse and achieve the great flowering of debate and ideas that we need to make our democracy work. A burning cross not only silences people like the Joneses, it impoverishes the democratic process and renders our collective conversation less informed. As Lawrence explains, given the history of cross burnings, how are they not a message to a black woman or man that you should be silent and know that you are in a subordinate place? On the occasion of the bicentennial of the constitution, Thurgood Marshall said this when he said he would not be celebrating the original document and then was asked about the bill of rights. The law of the first amendment as it is interpreted and applied in the vast majority of our courts and law schools proceeds as if it does not know these things that is the lived experiences of African Americans in the United States. It invokes the ideal of the quote marketplace of ideas as if all voices have equal access to that market. It speaks of the need to protect all speech as if there is not speech that silences and speech that is silenced as if those who are silenced are not always less powerful than those who are silenced. I cannot end without making one statement about a campus site and a campus work site and workplace since I for so many decades was a, a, a professor on one. Silence in the face of exploitation or racism or sexism or homophobia or bullying makes you complicit in the culture of oppression of fellow human beings. Any silencing of others who attempt to speak on such is as harmful as silence. On campuses where tenure is so highly valued, whether one is white or non-white, in situations in which non-tenured persons are not fairly treated and their own complaints are not attended to as harm to the entire community, then you must understand that your silence, as well as your silencing, not only does violence, it is violence. To the third lesson, analysis without action makes a person complicit in the maintenance of the injustice of the status quo. When there's a desire or need to do so, most human beings with a few exceptions have the capacity to examine a situation or see a problem, identify elements or factors and come to some determination about how to address it for purposes of meeting the need or solving a problem. I taught my students that they should remember that in reading about persons and groups in the past, it is important to see people living their lives as you and I do with similar challenges and capacities, feelings and flaws, difficulties and desires. Because in doing so, we respect the complexity of the human experience. In that way in which we have, we have whether we have formal education or not, people in the past had to determine how to navigate their way to what they saw or believed important in the use of their time. Thus, when we think of analysis, it is not only that which is done in the hallowed halls of academia, but also the human task of living and making sense of one's existence, connecting the dots, so to speak. Those who have had the opportunity to participate in higher education and acquire more knowledge or skills may have spent more time making reference to additional knowledge. But generally speaking, time and time again, we see that people are undertaking analysis to make sense of a situation or solve a problem. For example, Ella Baker saw economic and racial exploitation north and south, and that both had deep roots in the entire system of the United States. She also spent time with black working class people and youth in the process. She was convinced of something she had believed, namely that just as she, people knew what they wanted to improve their own conditions. And if given an opportunity, regardless of education or age could come together and organized to improve the conditions of their lives. Although working for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, heavily populated with male clergy leaders, in her role with SCLC, she convened a meeting of youth who had been operating all over the nation in nonviolent direct action protests, sit-ins, and the like. 
She developed an analysis for, of participatory democracy in the context of the struggle for freedom as a key to radical change in the United States. Fannie Lou Hamer learned to read and was employed as a plantation timekeeper where there were many African-American sharecropping families. She saw exploitation and abuse and cycles of poverty where there seemed to be no recourse. When she pondered these things, she was able to see that the impact of racism, poverty, and powerlessness on the lives of Black people was directly related to who held power and who made rules and laws and who had access to tools to put in or remove persons who had power. Her analysis included the conclusion that there was no significant opportunity to become truly free and eliminate just injustice unless those oppressed and abused had access to the ballot with which people could change the balance of power and the representation of Black people to those who would support freedom and justice. As we all know, Malcolm X began with an analysis essentially drawn from the teachings of the Nation of Islam, but he evolved with a variety of circumstances and experiences, particularly after his Hajj to Mecca. And the Malcolm X of 1964 and 65 identified the struggle of African Americans as one against an entire nation that not only engaged in racist assaults and economic exploitation, but also systemic racism, genocide, and a host of denials of human rights. Martin Luther King had advocated and engaged in nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience for years, yet saw after the achievement of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that systemic inequality and racism were still the order of the day and that the authorities and the powerful in the United States seemed to think they could move on to another agenda while ignore, ignoring what to him was obvious, the sicknesses of racism, excessive materialism, and militarism. When he looked at the shift from funds for a war on poverty to a war on Vietnamese, he saw no worthwhile end in sight. He was compelled to revisit his nonviolent direct action strategies and determine how he might utilize it as a tool to address racism, economic inequality, and poverty. No majority in power was willing to promote what he deemed necessary and recommended, a guaranteed annual income. So he assessed aspects of protest, the power of the masses and people, while the president and members of Congress, as well as some civil rights leaders, complained about his using his pulpit to protest the war. His thinking resulted in the publication of a book entitled Trumpet of Conscience in 1967, the year before his assassination. His his advanced analysis regarding nonviolent protest and civil disobedience was the following, something that most people do not tend to see when they think about Martin Luther King and his dream. I quote, nonviolent protests must now mature to a new level to correspond to black impatience and stiffened white resistance. This level is mass civil obedience. There must be a statement to a larger society. There must be a force that interrupts the society's functioning at some key point. Although the analyses of these four individuals offer important guidelines and principles for any who would engage in critical analysis of past, present United States, what made these individuals for the most consequential figures in the era of the civil rights movement and the beginning of the black power movement was not simply analysis, but that analysis led to action that contributed to major changes and a new birth of new consciousness, even radical consciousness. As Mary Frances Berry has said, analysis can tell us what is required, but it cannot make us act. Ella Baker's analysis and the, with the gathering of youth at Shaw University in Raleigh led to the birth of a separate youth civil rights organization the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, that worked in the Deep South, some coming to Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi from other states, but coming to work with youth and elders already engaged in freedom struggles in their local communities. It's described in books such as Barbara Ransby's Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, Bloody Lounge by Hassan Kwame Jeffries, and In Struggle by Claiborne Carson, as well as essays by Bernice Johnson Reagan. Fannie Lou Hamer's analysis led her to attempt to register to vote in 1962, for, she, for which she was not 
only the victim of economic reprisals and threats, but forced to leave Rulesville, Mississippi and brutally beaten. She became the field sec a field secretary for SNCC. She became a founding member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She ran for Congress. She undertook economic development and cooperative initiatives in Mississippi. And she attended most famously the 1964 Democratic National Convention where she spoke before the Credentials Committee as the representative for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She was televised and her speech was so compelling that the president then, Lyndon Baines Johnson, decided to cut her presentation to the Credentials Committee as it was being videoed and pretended that he had a special urgent announcement to make to the United States. And Fannie Lou Hamer in part said, all of this, all of this brutality on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings. The analysis of Malcolm X of 1964 and 1965 inspired Black advocates who both fought for liberation and believed in self-defense, including the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Oakland and in Chicago, the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party led by the brilliant Fred Hampton, who was working with C.T. Vivian and a broad-based coalition, Latinos and poor whites. And as most know, he was drugged and murdered in his bed. Malcolm X's analysis inspired freedom schools and universities that promoted a love of black people, our culture and fostered revolutionary consciousness. Malcolm X's analysis compelled him to travel internationally to promote the human rights of African-Americans and expose the genocide and systemic racial oppression of this nation, calling for, as did William Patterson and W.E.B. Du Bois before him, an investigation by the United Nations into the treatment of African-Americans. And Malcolm X's analysis prompted him to envision a path to liberation in coalition with other African-American organizations, groups working for human rights, freedom and justice through the formation of the Organization of Afro-American Unity before his assassination. Martin Luther King's analysis led him to stress the link between economic exploitation and racism and poverty without backing down. And as you all know by now, not only did he march with sanitation workers in Memphis where he was tragically assassinated, but he did, spent time working with others to develop plans for poor people's campaign that would bring the poor to Washington DC to create a tent city and sit in the offices of representatives and stall the mechanism of the government. The the Poor People's Campaign did, in fact, continue in honor and in memory of Martin Luther King, and the functioning of the government was, for a time, not able to be business as usual. The media focused on the tent city, committed not only poor people, but committed students, such as my older brother, Jesse J, and thousands more of unemployed did set up tents and the comfortable and the powerful were forced to watch this on television. In some of their writings, both Descartes and Sartre are correct. I think therefore I am, but for human reality as Sartre writes in Being and Doing, to be is to act. And although you have heard it before, as King declared, we are caught in a network of inescapable mutuality. None of this, none of the ills can be ignored without consequence. When all is taken into account, a person's life is a single statement of which every incident is but a partial rendering of the total life. Analysis can tell us what is required, but it cannot make us act. The wisdom of African-American philosopher, theologian, author, pastor, and former Dean of Howard University and Boston University's chapels Howard Thurman 
shares with us, and I must repeat it as a stubborn truth. Freedom is a sense of alternatives, of options. We live our days on the basis of the options we take. Every person has 24 hours at his or her disposal. How a man or woman deals with available options is determined in large part by what he or she seeks to be, become, or do in life. One option is always available to me. I can choose things for which I shall stand and work and live and the things against which I shall stand and work and live. Not to fight at all is to choose a weapon by which one fights. Mary Berry reminds us that analysis can tell you what is required, but it cannot make us act. If indeed what is always true is that I can choose for which I stand, then what I must also understand is that history teaches me that when analysis without action makes a person complicit in the maintenance of the injustice of the status quo, then as Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl explains, the freedom to take a stand is never complete if it has not been converted and rendered into freedom to take responsibility. I have offered to you what I strongly believe are three lessons from history and critical race theory. You see them on your screen. I now ask that you consider them, that you think about how it is that you might be engaged in history making in relationship to those lessons from history and critical race theory. And now I know you're wondering what happened in the story. So I'm going to return to the story that Fannie Lou Hamer told in 1971. The youth who traveled to see the wisest man in town found him sitting outside of his house. They approached him and, and they had the bird in their hands. They agreed that the one question they would ask the man was, who was purported to be the wisest man in town was this, this that we hold in our hands, is it alive or is it dead? Because they were fully prepared to crush the tiny bird if the wise man said alive and to set the bird free if he said dead. Old man, they smugly asked, this that we hold in our hands, is it alive or is it dead? The man looked at the youngsters and replied, it's in your hands. I have shared at length with you May I ask you to answer for yourselves questions that you will also see on the screen. What kind of history will you make with your life? And what kind of society do you want to live? What kind of society do you want to leave for coming generations? And by way of announcements and inquiries, if you are part of this campus community or alumni or part of the wider community, please note that I invite you to consider as we prepare for Q&A concerns we have noted as related to this campus regarding mental health. And I have shared information about mental health opportunities and access on the screen. It can also be available through the Stone Center. A wide community outreach through not only community university, but also sororities, fraternities, and the BSM initiatives that I hope you will consider as you think about how you make history. And finally, I must alert you to the crisis with our library and its resources. Please consider breaking your personal silence on the continuing vacancy of the Stone Center librarian post, adversely with other things affected by the budget cuts. The contact information for UNC's chief financial officer is posted in the PowerPoint and can be made available to you by the Stone Center. Again, these things and so much more, I must say are essentially in your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor McNeil. Uh, someone uh, placed in the chat uh, that they knew that there was gonna be some provocation but I wouldn't call it provocation. We can always call it truth telling, I'm sure. Um, I want to uh, 
start with and, and ask you to say a little bit about where you are on the Joan Little publication. And can you also, for a few folks, say a little, just, just a, a brief piece on who Joan Little is. Joan Little was a case in the North Carolina in 1974 when uh, Sonia Stone and I both came to the University of North Carolina. She was in a jail and sexually assaulted by a jailer. It was argued that she had enticed the jailer and used sex in order to escape. She contended that she struck the jailer with a ice pick, an ice pick that he had brought into the cell to defend herself. And after she ran away, he subsequently died. She then was put on trial for first degree murder. Her decision to stay in the United States rather than to go into exile was based upon her belief that she did not do anything wrong to defend herself against sexual assault. That statement itself then brought to the attention of many persons, including Angela Davis, the idea that one should not be on trial for first degree murder if one was defending herself against sexual assault. She had one African-American attorney, Karen Bethia, well, Karen Galloway at the time, now Karen Bethia Shields, a former judge in Durham and now a continuing uh, criminal defense attorney. She had four other white attorneys and a movement was developed with, in which there was cooperation between lawyers who were promoting social justice and the social movement activists looking at the death penalty, women's rights, sexual assault, African-American liberation, and a variety of prisoners' rights and a variety of other topics. I am, she was ultimately acquitted by a scientifically selected jury that was equally black and white. And they said that the state did not prove that she was guilty. I am in the process of completing chapters on the book. I suspect that I will uh, be able to have a published book in about a year. And I am looking forward to having the opportunity to talk about not just the social movement, but also social lawyering and the integrity of one who chose to defend herself in spite of the possibility of being executed in a gas chamber. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We're looking forward to that. Looking forward to you to come back and do your first book talk here as well. Um, I'm just going to put that in your ear. Uh, I just want to make mention of something. We have a question from Dorothy Sanders, but I'm going to preface it by suggesting that people, if they can get a hold of this today's Washington Post, there's a story in today's Washington Post about how young people are being forced to hide their college activism in order to get jobs. In other words, they have two uh, resumes, one that they keep for themselves and one that they use when they're applying for jobs. And it's noted that both of the resumes are, are true. It's just that they understand what the stakes are. So this question from Dorothy Sanders goes like this, and she's in the audience with us now. Can you share your thoughts on the balancing act one must undergo in making a decision to take action, knowing full well that actions to upset the status quo will impede one's personal success and livelihood, not to mention potentially hasten one's untimely demise? And she puts success in quotation marks. That question is probably one of the most challenging questions that each person must face. And my view is that we have seen the sacrifices that have been made in the past. And we have also seen the way in which persons making sacrifices have been able to sustain their activism and make decisions that do not challenge their integrity. No, not everyone will become 
successful and get the high ranking post if they stand up for what is right, if they oppose injustice. But what we see in history is that if we come together as people who are interested in justice and begin to have long range strategic planning for those things which we believe to be not only urgent but critical, then we are able to give people opportunities to move in and out of the limelight of public activism so that they may continue to do some of those things that are important to them as individuals and also when they are developing their careers and moving their lives forward, these things are important to us for we need lawyers, we need uh, physicians, we need plumbers, we need electricians, we need musicians, we need artists, we need uh, persons who are going to fulfill all variety of tasks that make that are necessary for a society to exist as a good and a just society. So at such time as one is needing to work on school or prepare for a bar exam, uh, let me give my own personal example, studying for comps at the University of Chicago. Uh, when I was in line activism and we were, we were blocking construction sites with C.T. Vivian, the Youth Nations uh, and the Black Panthers, those who were in the Youth Nations uh, who did not, have, did not go to school, were not having jobs, asked me what time was my class and that they would send somebody to take my place so we wouldn't have to break the line. Similarly, we want people to be able to move in and out of public positions, but maintain their support of that which is important in their lives and in our lives. I hope that answered your question. Well, I want to thank you once again for agreeing to join us. We've, we've been here now a little over an hour and a half, and um, we are actually saving the comments for you because the comments are beautiful, and I think they're very, very much uh, on point. Thank you for your advocacy for the library, uh, the libraries here at the university. We all join you in, um, in, in wishing that we really uh, need to make sure that our libraries continue to be fully funded. And I'm, I'm quite sure that people in the audience are gonna pass that message on as you've asked. And thank you once again for sticking to this path. Thank you so much. I know that you think you're going into uh, somewhat of a retirement, but I can assure you, you're gonna be getting a lot of calls over the next few years. So thanks again. Uh, again, the audience is continuing to uh, send in their notes, and we look forward to seeing you again. To everyone who stayed with us throughout the presentation, thank you all also. You are the reason we do this. And now that uh, Dr. McNeil has said a little bit about how we manage ourselves uh, as activists and uh, folks who are trying to stay in this place, um, we're going to look into doing something along these lines in the spring. Let's ask these questions and see what people uh, have to say about this. Be a very, very interesting conversation with us in the community. Thanks again, thanks to all. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in future programs. Thanks again to the Francini family. Thank you also to Jalen Neville, our uh, Sean Douglas fellow uh, for being with us and also to, to Nyjah King, who's been assisting us here in the office. Take care and good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.